I'm a bit worried about this rhetoric about just focusing on deaths. I mean, we know that uh, most of the critical care admissions are actually under 70 years. Most of the cases are well below that. And we know that many people suffer from long COVID. So 10% of people who get infected have long COVID, which we don't fully understand. So they have symptoms lasting for more than 12 weeks, including in children. So the idea that we accept a certain level of deaths and morbidity of a disease that we don't understand, which will also potentially lead to virus adaptation, which has already happened and threaten our vaccine response, over the idea of elimination makes no sense to me, given that there are many well, countries... We're not going to be able to eliminate COVID, are we? Why don't you think we'll be able to eliminate COVID? Actually, it's much more likely that we'll be able to eliminate COVID, which is something other countries have done, than achieve herd immunity with vaccination. Well, they have so up to now, DP. Tra- You're the clinical Sorry? epidemiologist. You tell me, yeah. but they've eliminated it. You're talking about the likes of Australia. But they've eliminated yes. it so far, but of course it could go back at any time in any country, especially when borders are open again, especially when people start going on holidays uh, again. You know, the long term is, I, I thought what you experts were telling us was the long term is we're going to have to live with COVID, it's here to stay now. Well, I mean, I'm really concerned that this is what the scientific, a lot of the scientific community in the UK seem to be saying when there is another strategy with less uncertainty associated with and far more evidence behind it than the idea that we live with it and accept a level of deaths and morbidity from a disease that we don't understand fully. And the potential for virus adaptation that we've already seen, which can render vaccines less effective or even ineffective over time. The idea that, you know, we're going to open schools without any mitigatory measures, any additional mitigatory measures, and not see the surges we saw before, to me, is really unrealistic. I think one of the problems here is that if we're going to say to people, uh, we're not going to open the schools, we're not going to open up the economy until we've eliminated this disease and the transmission of this virus and suppressed it forever, I mean, realistic, it's not realistic. And but I'm not saying that. that. I'm saying put mitigatory and safety measures in well, schools measures before you, you open them. I want to see mask like use. I would like to see uh, air filtration, ventilation devices with carbon so dioxide monitors. You want young children in primary schools wearing masks? I, I would like to see them encouraged to wear masks, as they are in many other parts of the world, including in Europe. This is not something new. And I would like to say air filtration devices, air purifiers in schools with carbon dioxide monitors that meet the standards of the CDC. The CDC also recommends that primary school children wear masks. I would like to see that. All I mean, of this is in line with current evidence. I don't agree evidence. with this. We are, we are not seeing outbreaks in primary school children in schools. And that is very, very clear. I mean, we've been working an- <laughs> on the absence data from schools from September so, through to December. We just don't see it in the data. So actually, I mean, I agree with what's been said. It's more the risk of... The other types of mixing that happen when schools open, it's not the school environments themselves so that the are public risky health, in the situation. The Public Health England surveillance data shows an equal number of outbreaks in primary and secondary schools consistently. And right now, the outbreaks in secondary in primary schools are higher because the attendance in primary schools is higher. So, I'm so talking about you the, tell me, sorry, you're, you're, you're yeah. obviously a medical professional, and I, I respect that. How yeah. many children from primary school age have been admitted to hospital with suffering from COVID? So I can tell you the data from primary and secondary schools. There have been 13. No, no, how many, hosp- how many children from primary schools have been admitted to hospital suffering from COVID? But that's, but that's not, see, that is a different point. It's about whether children get ill. I'm talking about whether children can transmit to others in the community who can get ill. Well, Those are two you separate down, questions. Community, you, you, you're basically saying that no one should mix with anyone at all, ever. No, that's not no. what I'm saying. I'm saying put safety measures in schools. I'm saying open schools with safety measures. How is that saying... Nobody should come into contact with anybody else. I didn't say that at all. Well, because what you're going to be saying then is is we're, we're saying primary schools should open and secondary schools as well. We're going to be talking about employment circumstances reopening. Um, and, and so if you're going to place restrictions like that on young children, what sort of restrictions are you going to place on employment uh, uh, environments? I'm it's talking about making immense. school environments as safe as workplaces. You know children can get long COVID. Between 12 to 15% of children infected have persisting symptoms after five weeks. Do you really want to expose children to that risk when you don't understand the law? The is, uh, are they suffering so yes, badly. they are suffering. They have, they it's very clear they're suffering. suffering. So how, many, how many have been admitted to hospital? 
you're suffering from COVID. So, so you, you're saying that them suffering from long COVID doesn't matter if they don't no, get no, I'm, admitted what I'm to saying hospital. Is, if they're seriously ill and have been admitted to hospital... So, so it's okay if they're dysfunctional. Care. It's okay if they're not functional if they don't get admitted to hospital. It's no, okay no, if they transmit to their parents and other vulnerable individuals in the community. That's fine. Is that what you're saying? No, I, I'm not saying anything. I'm, I'm, I'm challenging the position of people suffering very badly. What I've laid down is very much what the CDC and WHO guidance suggests, are you, are you even saying, for primary school children, yes. Are you saying, mm. Deepthi, that 12 to 15% of children infected have long COVID? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I'm not saying this based on anything that I'm saying. It's based on the ONS data that's been released on children that shows that 12 to 15% of children have... That's ON, the Office of National Statistics data. Yes, yes. I am gobsmacked by that. You can look it up. It's right out there. One in eight primary school children, one in seven secondary school children. Yes. And and what are the symptoms? What are the symptoms? They're a combination of things like cough, shortness of breath, palpitations, fatigue. Yes. Mike Tinsley, did you know this? You're saying that one in seven children have suffered from COVID. Have suffered from long COVID. So no, if no, they so, get. So, no, hang on, wait a minute. Are we, what, what sort of level of infection are we talking about amongst children of school age? Um, so, the current the prevalence, the so, the current prevalence among school age children is 1%. So, 1 in 100 children currently in the UK have infection. Of the children who have infection, 12 to 15% have persistent symptoms after five weeks. This is so, all so from one, the Office for National so, Statistics. So we're saying, so, so, so we get the facts here. So 1% yeah. of children have suffered from COVID. And of that, that 1%, you're saying that 10 to 15% have suffered from long, long so Yes, 1%. Saying, a very uh, small percentage of, no, of young No, no, no. Do not yes, misquote me on this. Today, one in 100 children in the UK have COVID, right? Of that percentage, every single day. So this is on one day, 12 to 15% will go on to develop long COVID. If you look at the numbers of children infected, they are huge. They're in the millions. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 it's just the first time I've heard this. I know you're saying the statistics are available. Yeah. I'm going to go yeah, look at are. these statistics. <laughs> Uh, tonight, when I'm in bed after this show, because I find <laughs> I'm it happy to send interesting. This to you. Well, please do. I, I find it interesting. I find it gobsmacking. So, in this country, you're saying that there are millions of children infected, and yes. you are saying that the ONS data would, would would state that one in seven of those children infected will suffer long COVID. Yes, that is what the ONS data says. And there are millions of children who have been infected, yes. So if there are millions of children who have been infected, then that would suggest, like, do you know how many million? No, I don't know how many million have confirmed infection from primary school. Um, I know that that, the prevalence has been... But that would suggest that we have at least hundreds of thousands of children in this country (laughs) with long COVID. Well, well so I've, symptoms, just, I've just looked at the yeah, ONS yeah. statistic, and it seems to claim that actually about half a million children have so far been infected with um, with COVID. So, but your statistics would claim that actually it's about seventy thousand that would have been suffering from long COVID. So it's way below the several million that you just said. So the half, just let me clarify, half a million are confirmed cases. So you will find that children are much less likely to have symptoms. So if you look at the ONS data, you will see the prevalence in children throughout this. So particularly through October and November has been 2 to 3%, which is much higher than in other age groups and suggested by the confirmed cases. And the ONS data includes asymptomatic and mild cases as well. So the 500,000 that you're talking about is a huge underestimation because it's based on system ba- uh, symptom-based testing. And so, Deepthi, you're, 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 you're saying that you believe, and the, the data would, would, back, would back, that we have hundreds of thousands of children in this country yes. yeah. who will have long-term symptoms like what? Long-term s- symptoms like chest pain, breath- breathlessness, cough, exhaustion, uh, gut symptoms, um, the ONS is a list that they collect data on, and all of these symptoms, uh, one or more of these symptoms, persist in children for more than five weeks. 
in one in seven to one in eight of children who get infected. And these are children, including children with mild and asymptomatic infection. So they don't need to meet the criteria that you're talking about of symptom-based testing. Because parents listening to, to you tonight, they will go, they will look at those ONS, that ONS data. If, 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 if this data is, is, is robust and, there, and if there are hundreds of thousands of children in this country with long COVID, that puts a completely different perspective on opening up the schools before they're vaccinated. 